Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carlo McCormick. I'm an art writer, and I'm um, I get the honor of uh, asking questions of one of the great pioneers of the comic book medium and uh, one of the preeminent painters today, Mr. Robert Williams. So <clears throat> I think we should, you know, he's really famous as a painter now, but he was very radical and seminal and revolutionary and all those words in comics. So, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with a little bit of comic stuff because of the nature of this festival. Absolutely. All right. Sure. So, start in here. The, the thing in. with Robert is that uh, he, he gets his first, his first major uh, break input as the art director for this guy, uh, Ed Big Daddy Roth, who's uh, kind of the maestro of car customizing. And so you're you're coming out of that, and then it's the '60s, so you also get that good kind of kick to the side of the psyche from psychedelics. And I'm just curious, like, how these two things, like, as major inputs, plus your kind of down-home American previous life, how they kind of translate into comics. Funny books. Funny books. Well, um, as a young person, I was visually oriented. And I started picking up funny books in the late 40s as a little kid. Are these like Tijuana Bible funny no, books? No, no. That's what you used to call comic books was funny books. Oh, okay. So, I, that's when, that's when the you, old term for comic books, When did you get to lay, lay your hands on your first Tijuana Bible, though? Uh, it was early on. Yeah. It, it was really early on. It was a revelation. Yeah, I, I Someone showed me one when I was about nine. And that's the first time I understood the physical mechanics of making other people. Uh, and then, I, uh, do, do we want to go off on this? Well, I, 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 I never talked to you about Tijuana Bibles. What do you think? And then, some about a year or two after that, at some baseball game, some kid showed me this pointographic photo from World War II, and I just that didn't look fun to me. That didn't that didn't look exciting to me. I liked the, the Tijuana Bible. It was more interesting. But anyway, the, the thing about the comic books was I was visually oriented and uh, started uh, picture reading comics before I could read the, the speech balloons in them. And uh, then uh, I got to be about nine or ten where I could read fairly well, and I stumbled across a variety of really intense comics like classic comics and whatnot and horror comics and then I got into the MEC comics and they were they were very corrosive to my young mind you know and I just they were well drawn exciting they portrayed drama and contrast and you know just just the greatest stuff you know and, uh, and then uh, I, I remember distinctly getting an EC comic and there was an ad in the back or somewhere in it for a new EC comic they were coming up with called Mad Comics, you know. And it wasn't like, like back then, <clears throat> mad was like a joke. It was like mad meant mental illness, see. I thought, wow, a, a crazy comic. And I thought, whoa. <laughs> they found the right demographic with yeah, you. Yeah. God, and it just big, bold, gothic letters, mad. I've got to get this one. And I started looking at that. And then I realized that this is the first time in my life I kind of started understanding there was a thing called abstract thinking. You know, it was like supposed to be satirical humor. But then it, it, it was just... As a kid, I could see this is just more than that. There's a sarcasm in this, see? and I just eat that shit with a shovel, man. I'm telling you, <clears throat> and it was just remarkable. And you know, they said uh, the comics are creating juvenile delinquency and mental problems, and they were right. Yeah. They were. <laughs> they were right, man. I, got, I couldn't get enough of them things, you know, and. Uh, and then I, as I got older, I, I drew more and more. I was always a, an artist of some measure, and the comics really stimulated me. And then uh, later on, uh, 
I tried to be an artist, and I, when, when, I, when I was in elementary school and in junior high, middle, middle school, I did, always got A's in art, always got A's. <clears throat> and they would, there'd be like a class project, and they, of the 30 kids in class, they'd pick maybe four or five that looked like they had some kind of propensity for art. And they'd send them down to the hall <clears throat> on a mural, on a big piece of butcher paper or something, and these kids will do their little thing, you know, and I'd look at it, and shit, I had to make a composition out of their noodling, you know, because it was just too pathetic, you know, like someone had to unify this mess, you know. So things that were big, I'd make in the foreground and show some foliage and woods and some cliffs and escarpments and take all their little aspirations and Dignify them, you know, and oh. and then I, as I got older and got into high school and got got into a lot of trouble, a lot of police trouble and whatnot. I always had that art to fall back on, you know. And when I was with gang members and criminals and stuff, they always knew I had a propensity for drawing, and I could entertain people with, yeah, yeah. with drawing, you know. So then I thought, well, I'm quite the artist. I'm quite the goddamn artist, you know. <clears throat> I said, the girl's going to like me. <laughs> <laughs> so then I got, I got into art school, and I realized, how wrong could you be, pal? That being able to draw was a, a, a negative. It's not a positive, you know. And I, I, I came out to California to go to Los Angeles City College because it was only a $5 semester school. It was a public school, you know. So I went there and I thought, man, I'm, I'm gonna knock him dead. But it was right, right in the middle of abstract expressionism, you know. And I start to do some tight draftsmanship, and they just stop me. Go, oh, no, no, you, you, no, that, that, that's like an illustrator. No, you know, put some emotion into this thing. Show some spontaneity, you know. So I was realizing that people were turning out rather light, large size canvases. <clears throat> In a day, yeah, no, that take me that long to prime a canvas. <laughs> and, <clears throat> you know, and they, they, it was just like all over the United States and Europe. It was just abstract expressionism. It just, and I, the teacher would say, "Now you can't have any converging lines because that suggests perspective." Saying we were just two dimensional. You know, we were trying to develop a sense of two dimensional integrity here with you. So I'm, you know, I, I'm young and malleable, so I said, well, these, these people know what they're doing. I'd better go along with this, you know, and I just was not getting any personal gratification out of doing <coughs> real sloppy work, you know, and it's like tying a brick to your hand or something. It's just, and I just, I had this peer group that went to the different art schools in Los Angeles, and they just said, you're an illustrator, man. You're, you're not a painter. You're an illustrator. And, I, and as I told you before, I was in a lecture class one time, and uh, the professor uh, showing us slides of art, and he had a big blow up of uh, Peter Paul Rubens' Christ Descending the Cross, and he said, this is not a painting. This is a colored-in drawing. And I knew my ass was in trouble right there. Yeah. My, my, my aspirations are really screwed up. I know that uh, the days of draftsmanship and art were long gone, and I was just fumbling through the fog like I do in everything else. You know, I'm on the wrong track. So uh, I got married, and I had to get some kind of job, and I had this skill for propensity, and so I got a job as the art director for Black Belt Magazine and did illustrations in Black Belt Magazine, a karate magazine. And then this is the, the earlier years when I was taking a lot of acid and I was kind of a psych psychedelic cavalier, you know, and they, they saw that I wasn't a company man. If I lost that job and then I got another job for a real right-wing uh, company called Warehouser, and I was a container designer for Warehouser, you know, dressed in a suit and whatnot. And it didn't take them long to realize that I was not executive stock. 
<laughs> so <clears throat> they they cut me loose, you know, and so you know I went back down to the unemployment agency. You go down to the unemployment agency and tell them you're an artist, and it's like a joke. So it's like, yeah, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I'm an artist, and I'm, I need a job. So they said, well, we don't have anything, but we got this we got this one job, but nobody will take it because the conditions down there are, are, are not very good and the place is kind of filthy. And I said, what is it? And he says, they're looking for an art director for Ed Big Daddy Roth. And I said, give me the telephone. <laughs> <clears throat> so I got that job, and all of a sudden, I'm farting through silk. I'm making a lot of money. And I can come and go. I let my hair grow out, but I just had to m meet deadlines, and that was it, you know. And I'm a disciplined person, and man, my life changed. Me and Suzanne, we were doing good, you know. And I can't, and then, you know, Roth hired me, and, and he explained to me, you know, we, we, we deal in imagination here, you know, and uh, we like to really explore the wild side of things. And, so I got wild, all right, you know, and they already had a list of things that I could not do, you know, no, no reference to mother or God or body fluids or sex or a whole list of things. This whole thing was to keep it really PG, right? Yeah, like and, and, and still, even with this big thing of regulations, I was usurping their values, their moral code, you know, and so... And then Roth had a competitor, another hot rod competitor named Stanley Mouse. And, and then I met, I met Mouse. And Mouse later went up to San Francisco, and he was one of the big five in the psychedelic poster movement, say. So, um, you know, I got to meet all those guys and whatnot, and that led to me getting into Zap Comics, say. And, uh, then I could really let go, you know. I would... I would I kind of dodged the draft, and uh, it was during the Vietnam War, and the country was really starting to fall apart. And I'd or I, I belonged to the drug culture in the late '50s, early '60s, way before the Vietnam War, and, and so I was kind of a seasoned veteran culturally, you know. For <clears throat> so um, anyway. Um, I got into Zap Comics, man, and you know, and I, when I saw that first Zap Comic, it's just like when I was that little kid and I saw that first Mad Magazine, that first Mad Comic, you know, and whoa, whoa, people are doing this. So when I got to be around the, the, the other six Zap artists, I realized that these guys also had high art education and they faced the same thing with abstract expressionism, you know, and so... Uh, you know, we all could draw, and we we're all um, understood perspective and anatomy and composition and the use of color, and we all had dirty minds, and you know, and all uh, what you call um, uh, uh, what's the um, we're, we're revolutionary. I mean, now, there's a there's a better uh, uh, calcitrant, recalcitrant. There's a word called recalcitrant that means you, you in the army. This is a good place to discuss it. In the army. If you're considered a recalcitrant, that means you cannot be trained. You cannot be broken. You cannot be disciplined. So we, we were all seven recalcitrant fart knockers, you know. <coughs> and so, you know, all very skilled. Yeah. And did, did all of them seem to come from a similar... I mean, obviously all have different backgrounds, but did everyone kind of come from this... Same lineage. Well, like, okay. Let's, let's talk. East? Let's talk about the goddamn king, Crum. Yeah. You know, Crum's dad was a career marine sergeant. Crum is a direct descendant of Oliver Cromwell. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. so we all had screwed up backgrounds. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I was shoved into a military situation very young. My, my father was a, a southern military man and very disciplined and very religious. And then my mother was a liberal Yankee, you know, so I'm caught between these two philosophies all my life, you know. So, yeah, we're all, we all had our uh, psychological problems and it created a, a psychosis in art, yeah. you know. And you got to remember, the art during this time is abstract expressionism, and then pop art started sliding in there. And, and I thought, well, pop art, oh, that's going to be great. Oh, because it's back to realism. Well, actually, all it was is appropriation. You know, yeah. pop art's just about 
taking things you see and redoing them, you know, so that your imagination is just as withered there as it is uh, with the abstract expressionism. <clears throat> So I, I'd always painted, and in my free time, I always painted real tight paintings, and by golly, I just had a bunch of them, and I sold them for a lot of money to a millionaire, but I couldn't get an art show. I couldn't get published. I couldn't get nothing done, you know? But I did find this Zap crew mm -hmm. that were sympathetic to me and understood, so I knew I wasn't alone in the forest here, you know? <clears throat> So, uh, and I remember last night we were talking, you, you kind of, you divided them up in a certain way. You were saying that how some of them were more narratively driven. They were really like people yes, like, yeah. maybe Crumb would be more in the middle. Yeah, but Spain they, and Crumb, and I forget. Did, did, some of them like the story, the literature part of Gilbert Crumb. Gilbert yeah, really tax heavy. Yeah, and me and Rick Griffin and I don't know who Victor. else. L like the like the imagery, you know, like the talk talking <laughs> pictures, you know. Yeah. But anyway, uh, you know, I'm selling paintings, but it was, I couldn't have a show. I couldn't get published. You look at art form, and you die of boredom right there. You know, <clears throat> you know, it's just like a. a um, critical mass boredom. Is there such a thing as critical mass boredom? Is it, does it get so damn bored that you implode? <laughs> you know, and so I, I, I have no inspiration out of the art world. I just, you know, I just did not want to be an illustrator. I, I'm a goddamn painter. You yeah. know, I push paint around on a canvas and use my imagination. You know, so then. Then come the punk rock movement, see? And I knew a bunch of knucklehead young punk rock artists, see? And I, I realized that these guys, they, they would go to after-hours clubs and put on these shows, which was an excuse to sell booze without a license, and, you know, and you had, like, this really young, degenerate crowd out after one or two at these after-hours clubs looking at this goofy art, and I realized, well... If I slop it up a little bit, I'll have a peer group. Okay? <laughs> <clears throat> so I started doing these zombie mystery paintings that were nothing but sex and violence and slop, you know. But I, you know, I could draw, and it had anatomy in it, and composition, and strong use of psychedelic colors. So I, I immediately found a not only a peer group, but a buying audience. So I couldn't paint these things fast enough. They were just jumping off the walls, you know, and then. As the years go by, I put a little more detail and a little more detail and a little background, and all of a sudden I got the paintings back to the standard that I want them, you know. And that then by this time, other artists had kind of caught onto this too, and I'd kind of freed an area in the world. Now, there was one other artist in the world, this is like about 68, that was doing realism. And his name was Matty Clarwine in New York, and he was yeah. fairly well known. Well, so I'm on the West people Coast. People here would know him because uh, Santana and, and uh, Miles Davis would use his paintings much later for record yeah. covers. So I knew that Matty Clarwine was in New York doing realistic paintings. He was a friend of Salvador Dali's or something. And then I'm on the West Coast, but we're pretty, you know, that, that's it. I mean, really, that's it. So years later, when I met Matty Clarwine, I says, hey, what, what happened to you? You know, uh, I'm over here fighting on the West Coast for realism. What happened to you? He says, I couldn't take it. Yeah, he moved I, to Mallorca. Uh, he, he moved to Mallorca. He says, I could not take the pressure from the abstract expressionists and the pop artists. I had to get the hell out of here. And I said, well, fuck you, man. I'm, I'm holding the whole ship up here. And I'm not that. <laughs> I, I got other things to do in my life. I have a crusade, you know. <laughs> So, but, but finally, finally, I had enough following, and, you know, enough other young artists that, could, that understood comic book art and whatnot, you know. And um, it, it kind of dawned on me that, you know, why try to sophisticate the things? Why, you know, I love cartoons. I love comics. I want to translate that into paintings, you know. There is no other form of visual art that you can express more abstraction and exercise your imagination than cartoons. Cartoons are not silly things for children. They're a language, and a language that needs to be progressed and developed. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I come up with a magazine called Juxtapose. 
and it started off, we went to the people, I, I had a couple of attempts at it, but I went to the people at Thrasher, the skateboard magazine, and told them, well, you know, I, they'd already had me on a cover of a couple of magazines, and they liked my work, and I said, well, why don't we do a magazine of just this kind of stuff, you know? And they had the money and the uh, distribution connections, and uh, they said, yeah, we'll give it a try, you know? So me and some friends started it off, and it started off with 23,000 copies, and it sold great. Okay, it, started, it was in the black immediately, and it started selling and selling and selling. But the, the, the art schools would not allow it in class, see? It's in every goddamn art school now, see? Yeah. But then they, they, they would not tolerate this magazine. So it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then before long, it outsold Art Forum. Then it got bigger and bigger, and it outsold Art in America. And then it outsold the big one, Art News. And juxtapose become the number one selling art magazine in the world. See? The little shitty magazine. It, uh, yeah. you know. So then it became enormously influential. You know, and um, the whole careers were. The yeah, whole, whole but then you know, then it had a life of its own, and I'm just an old turd, and so you know, it went on to yeah. develop itself, as you could see. You know, and. Uh, I don't know. Where else should I take this story? Oh, I, it's I pretty good. It's good. <laughs> I, wanna, you know, I never did get like, those girls. Carl, you do such good interviews with Robert. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's good. I just ask him a question and he talks. Okay, it's okay. Good. Uh, okay. Yeah, you know, you probably answered every question I had well, for you. Well, make up some. Uh, yeah, no, I, one thing, I, you know, just out of curiosity, is it true that, like, Ratfink and Big Daddy mm. Ross character. That was a caricature of Stanley Mouse, right? That's why no. it wasn't. No. Okay. No. I got to stop telling that lie no, then, huh? No, no. Mouse likes to say that uh, Roth stole it from him, but he, he didn't. Steve Allen on the Tonight Show or whatever it was had a, a, a slang remark about you're a rat fink. See, oh, okay. this was back in the 50s, late 50s, early 60s. And I guess simultaneously a couple of people come up with what they. They think a rat fink is. I got a, a, a Steve Allen pin. It's just a little rat that says rat fink on it. You know, it has nothing to do with that character, but uh, I don't know. You know. He was the, probably the first underground cartoon character, yeah. rat fink, I guess. You know. I, so, yeah, somewhere in there. Charlie yeah. the Tuna. Yeah. <laughs> that was a, well, a you know, I was guy. always upset about Charlie Tuna because they, yeah. they, they, they slammed the Bohemian community. Yeah, that was it. You know, he, I hated that. Making fun of a beatnik. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was, uh, I, I was very offended yeah, yeah. by that. I, I should have picketed uh, were you, were you, Chicken uh, of the Sea. Were you doing that kind of that classic beatnik 50s thing? No. I went through a Bohem a beatnik period. Yes, yeah. I did. Yeah. And I, I, I was a little younger and I hung out around college campuses did and you wear, played like, chess. Uh, you know, uh, like berets. Yeah, and yeah. Did the goatee? I confess. Yeah. No, yeah. I did not. Not a goatee, but I took. I took smoke reefer, and you know. Yeah. Was, they were yeah. hipsters. They were the hipsters yeah. of that time. Pardon? They were the hipsters of that time. No reason. They were. were. Yeah. Absolutely right. And there was there was like two or three movies. Like America didn't know what beatniks were, but there's two or three movies that kind of set the style. There was this shitty movie called The Beat Generation. Right. And then another movie called Bell, Book, and Candle with Kim Novak. And then that, that set the whole pattern of what a beatnik yeah, was supposed yeah. to look like. So. Yeah, she was, she, was, she was pretty sexy then. Yeah, yeah. Um, I liked it. Who's fucking her now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you've had, you've had a little bit of a confrontational situation with this progress of modernism but it is kind of cool that we are in the armory where like America's kind of psyche cracks open Duchamp does the new descent yeah, the staircase right. all this you're stuff right. like that so how beholden are you to that history or, or do you have to kind of go back to Tiepolo yeah, you cannot escape that you cannot escape that and you have to understand history I and mean, you have to understand it really well and Marcel Duchamp said the day will come when an artist can point to something and predicate that as art yeah. well that that, that's a great philosophy, but unfortunately, it's happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you've got legions, hundreds of thousands of young people that go to art school that are, are not interested in developing a craft yeah. because they can just predicate something. You know? It's the Duchamp yeah, you can see. Yeah, it's, it's uh, conceptualism. You know, I, I stand behind conceptualism because if they, if, if they can cut a fart over here, I can do a masterpiece over here. It's just, you know, it's one, the other side of the coin. But you've had friends, and I mean, like, 
you and Ruche and people like that, you're kind of tight with some of those guys. Who I tight. am, and yeah. I'm respectful to, to yeah. them too, yeah. and I'll defend them because yeah. they, they want to do what they want to do. I, mean, I have to defend what they want to do, so I'll have room over here so someone will defend me. Okay. See? All right. it's, it's an open playing field of imagination. <laughs> you know, Everyone's a damn artist. If you can wiggle your left toe, you're an artist. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. Uh, well, well, where do I go with that one? Um, well, how much time? I can tell oh, them all yeah. day. I can tell the sandwiches all day. Uh, yeah, we're gonna have, there there should questions. be a question and answer. So let's go another five minutes okay. here. Let's see what I can think up here. Um, let's see. Well, well, yeah, let me just let me ask you okay. something really specifically because so, so we started maybe with this idea of translating these things, in, all these life experiences, all this weirdness, this psychosis that is Robert Williams into this thing called a comic. And then, you know, you, you did a really good job explaining the history and evolution out of it, but you then translate comics into a fine art form. But one of the things that happens in the course of that is you split that dynamic of where words with pictures. And it is a, it's a wild thing because Robert's also this amazing writer, you know, it's like I can really appreciate his writing. I make a living because most artists, no matter how brilliant they are, they, they, they can't put their thoughts out at all. So that's how I make a living. This guy actually can. He can, you know, galvanize a movement. You can do all these things. But it, it splits. So then you start writing manifestos. You kind of do, you know, juxtapose. Yeah. You do a lot of writing in there. And you get these really elaborate titles. But do you kind of miss that moment where the words and the pictures were one, which was what you were doing with comics? Well, yes, yeah. Now, here, here's the problem with comics, and here's the problem with graphic paintings. A comic book is enormously wonderful because it's just a movie requires millions of dollars and thousands of people, but a comic book could be done by one person. But the art in a comic book is all, one panel is always subjugated to the use of the next one coming up. See? Mm -hmm. It gets past, say, the minute you get to the next panel. So you, you, if you spend too much time on a beautiful panel, that's just going to be breezed over as soon as the guy reads the balloon. See? But on the other hand, a painting can be really a, a, a still monumental thing, but it, it lacks that fourth dimension of time. See? It doesn't move. See? So you got you, you got to weigh which one of those you, you're, you're more, more interested in. An another point I want to make is... Uh, I remember when I was a kid, comic books were just a little bit better than toilet paper in our country. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, and I'm looking, the, the effect of graphic novels now in the movie industry and in our culture is enormous. Our life is just affected enormously by comic books, and everyone respects them except the goddamn art world. No. You know? <clears throat> The we're, art world will not deal with them. When I got, they send me to lectures all across the country, and it's always under the auspices of the literature department. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> so. Well, I remember talking to Frizz Freeling, you know, a guy who kind of predates you a bit. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he used to work for Disney back in Kansas City, back when Walt was out there starting his fascist empire. But... Uh, he uh, he ended up doing a lot of stuff for Warner Brothers Frizz, yeah. and he did like uh, I think he created Sylvester and Yosemite Sam, and then he he finally realized how he was being pretty fucked over, pretty bad, you know, yeah. uh, nickel a day kind of things for these things which were making a lot of money, and he, he created the Pink Panther and he made all the money from that, mm -hmm. so he wasn't quite as bitter as some of those guys, but he always just broke it down to me simply. It's like. If you're working class, you, you did commercial art. You went and you got those yeah. degrees. And then if you're a rich kid, you went to like this art school or you learned to slop around paint. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, well, that, that struggle goes way back into the 19th century, you know. Frederick Remington was caught between the world of illustration and fine art. You know. George Montgomery Flagg, a, a, a lot of people. Yeah. There was easy money for them in illustration and they had this wonderful benefit of the new pr printing processes. Right. But they kind of subjugated themselves in that fine arts thing, you know. And it's time for the the people that can draw and think to try to take the art world back. Yeah, yeah. And you caught a really tough moment there because, actually, it was it was a really long, tough battle that happened in the art schools in America to 
for the modernism to actually take hold. It, you know, because yeah, oh, yeah. modernism's right. raging for like 50 years, changing the world. And then you yeah. go to an art school, and they're still trying to teach you how to make a Fragonard painting yeah. or a Tiepolo or something yeah, like that. They they, they so, overworked realism. Yeah. They, in, the, in the 20s and 30s, teens, 20s and 30s, they overworked uh, representational art. And on top of that, representational art was kind of saccharine and sentimental and yeah. crappy and decorative, you know, and, but those times are not around anymore. I, mean, I think people can visually um, adjust to like yeah. far out abstract thinking and yeah. visuals, you know. So. Hey, so let's uh, let, let some questions? Uh, these people ask questions. You, you guys up for that? Yeah. You got one right here? Are you still a hot rodder? I'm afraid so. <laughs> oh, you yeah. tell, tell them about your cars real quick. That, that, that's a heroin I can't get rid of. You know, me and my wife, Suzanne, I got too many cars. You know, I got two 32 Fords, a Roadster, and a Coupe. And my wife, Suzanne, has got a Corvette powered 34 Ford and a 57 T Bird. And we just acquired this 1913 Model T that's bone stock. And it's just a junk, we can't keep the junk away. You know, it's like children. So, any, any other questions? Yes. I'm really interested in hearing you talk about uh, the delicacy of, of the watercolors that you're doing and uh, contrast to the large-scale, older, brighter work on campus. Can you talk a little bit about the watercolors? Well, you want me to be frank with you? Yeah, why not? Okay. <laughs> watercolors, has, watercolors and oil washes have never been my cup of tea. Now, I, um, I can appreciate them. But they're, they're a little anemic to me. But I've been working on them and trying to get a style just in case I have a stroke. <laughs> so I can, I can have a reputation as a watercolorist and wash painter before my medical condition set in. <laughs> Uh, uh, let me, I, I had other works, but I, 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 well, I think at the time, I, I've only had a week or two to do the things, and because they wanted fresh new art, so I, that, that's what I did, you know, of, of course I would much rather, much prefer real tight oil paintings, but I think, I think if I had a real tight oil painting on those walls, the rest of the paintings would have probably curled up like pork skins. Because <laughs> uh, there's a reason you don't mix abstract expressionism and, and real tight realism, because they contrast horribly. And, and I, I would have either looked pretentious or the other people would have looked amateurish. And so curators really stay away from that. Now, I was in a show in Orange County you know, with an abstract expressionist. And I went through his stuff and found the stuff that's the most cartoony that would work well with my paintings. And then I wrote treatises on each one of his paintings describing how brilliant they were. So I could cover myself, say. <laughs> but, it, you know, I, I think somewhere down the line they ought to integrate together. But. Uh, there's enormous resistance against that. I'm not against abstract expressionism. I'm against it taking over for, for 40 years, see? I mean, I, I, if I go into a, a doctor's office or something, I don't want to see some horrible thing I did in there, you know? I want some, <laughs> some mild graphic thing, you know? And, uh, you know, you, like abstract expressionism is the best art in the world for modern architecture, you know, for a bank lobby or something like that, you know. It's just, it just doesn't say very much, you know. It's probably not responsible to it, so. I don't know, did I get too talky for you on that? I love it, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, George. Hey, Robert. Um, it's something that I've been, I've been really thinking about a lot. Um, Lately, and you and uh, Carlo kind of touched upon it a little bit last night at the, at the Q and A. But it's um, you know you do mention that Juxtapose now is the number one art magazine in the world. Yes, it sells everything. It does. And and 
I, I mean, in a way, it's like you, you and Juxtapose are now the new academy. And there's like lots of artists that paint like you. And it's really annoying. <laughs> and, 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 you know, because you, you can pick, I don't even look at Juxtapose anymore, because I know what I'm going to see in it. You know well, what I mean? And it's just like, it's just like everyone's trying to be you now. Well, any, any, any art you know? movement that succeeds becomes stale. Yeah. And from where I'm looking at, like, I don't think I'm going to be coming stale <coughs> too soon. I don't think. Uh, no, you're not. I don't think. Uh, I don't think I'm going to reach the high level of where I'm going to bore people to death. You know. I, uh, no, everyone else will. Who's trying to imitate you? Well, you know as well as I do that from what I've started, there's been a side school of big-eyed children and tiki's and you know softer material. You know, and I don't know. I don't know anymore. I don't know anymore. You know, I just drink bourbon and watch television. You know, I can can't deal with it, you know, let the, let the young people take over, you know, I don't, I don't know what to do. They kind of are, like you even touched upon that, they're, yeah. they're painting the tiki's and the big eyed children. Yeah. And it's, it's funny also, because Juxtapose has also moved on, they cover a lot of kind of post graffiti and street art. And, yeah, that's true. And w which is, which is kind of interesting because when you were talking about this, you know, the problem side of what comics is, is like you could put all this work into a panel, but the people are being so driven by their, the narrative that they're going to kind of skip over it. This is one of the things, basically what you, what you like about painting is the contemplative gaze. That like, when someone gets one, whatever one of these, that it demands a certain amount of attention for a certain yeah. amount of time. You yeah. can live with it on your wall and will continue to yeah. nurture and inform you. And one of the things that more, these more immediate actions on the street happen is that they're not meant for the contemplative gaze. Yeah, but. that's right. That's right. And I, I, I like to think of my audience as a, a little more intelligent and a little more investigative. You know. Yeah, you be careful about meeting them then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I'm interested that you're, you, you talk about it that you are very interested in these groups of people, like around the hot rodders or. Um, I was wondering about, um, did you get to know people around National Lampoon or Playboy? There were, there were interesting constellations of artists. I, I did. I had work uh, in uh, Playboy and uh I think National Lampoon did a, a, a satire on one of my comic strips. I, I, I kept in touch with a lot of those people. Yeah. That was a long time ago. I, I remember submitting some cartoons to one of those magazines, and they wrote back, and they said, well, we, we don't know what to do with this stuff. It's, it's too much like art. <laughs> so, so when you became involved with Tony Schifrazzi, he has interesting people there, too. Tony Schifrazzi, in my opinion, was the best. Yeah. You know, and, and George and Hiroko there are, work for Tony Schifrazzi. We, we've got representatives here from Tony Schifrazzi, and he's, a, he's, he's rough. And he's an asshole, but he was the best. He tolerated a lot. He would give me a great show, but uh, you know, uh, I couldn't have been more honored. I was with him for 22 years, you know, and uh, it's just uh, wonderful that that he accepted me into that situation, you know, with uh, Kenny Scharf and um, Basquiat and Keith Haring, and, yeah, and, you know, and I'm. I'm indirectly related to that a little bit, you know, and all those people were cartoon related, you know, I'm keeping contact with Kenny Scharf, he's a very close friend, you know, he's been in juxtapose. And, uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. How long did it take, it seems like Zap has been, has been in print uh, since perpetuity, since the 60s, and like you can still go to any head shop and there's still a dusty copy of Zap on the, sh on the, on the show? And, and, well, there aren't any hits. Well, you, you can just find those at comic book shops. They've all been reprinted. You can hunt them up now. They wouldn't like to do that. I'm coming from the West Coast, but, but I'm just curious um, how long it took to crank out an issue of, of, of that back in the old days? It took years because we were all high strung and had other things to do. Yeah. You know, and we get together and have jams and parties and. Um, uh, rub our egos against each other and yeah. have a big time, you know. And uh, we all we're all making money doing something else, but we love to uh, we love Zap. You know? So it's a pretty dysfunctional family. It, yes, it's very very dysfunctional. And in a way, Rick's passing was kind of it, it seemed to somehow that 
weird magical guy that seemed to well we, 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 we all have our problems you know and we, we were bohemian artists to the bone you know we weren't like disciplinarians or anything you know and rick griffin uh was uh, very religious so uh, when he wasn't with a bunch of girls and dope dealers you know and, so I just, uh, he'd, he'd get a job, make $20,000 and disappear for three months, you know, and then you wonder why Zap took so long to do. You know? <laughs> 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 I, I don't know, you know, and I'm probably not any better at it, you know, and uh, I don't want to go into the personalities of these people, but Zap was quite a mix. It was really quite a mix, and originally the FBI and the government really tried to clamp down on those underground comics. They were really brutal. And, uh, I think something like 150 dealers in New York went to jail, and uh, 75 in San Francisco, 75 in Los Angeles, figures like that. People selling those underground comics in the late 60s. They, they tried to stop them. You know, and, uh, they just couldn't. They just got more popular and more popular. I, I, I got away from your question, didn't I? No, that was great. Okay. Is there any other people that want to? Yes? It's an honor to be here and listen to you. Well, gosh. <laughs> Leave a dollar at the door. to your art supplies, right? No, thank you. Thank you. When I see your work, I, first thing I think, how do you plot something out that's so big? Without, at some point, oh my God. Well, I do that for a living, you know. <laughs> That's the way I get those checks to the door. You know, I've been a truck driver and dug ditches, you know, worked for a carnival, short order cook, forklift operator. I think I would figure out how to do those pictures at home. It's <laughs> <laughs> so complex. No. Well, now some people don't see that as a virtue, you know. They say that's a horror vacue. That's a sign of a sick person who has to crowd those pictures, you know. So it's, I'm being the devil's advocate with myself, say here. I'm, I'm feigning. I'm feigning humility. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's two words. There's two words that are that have never been in the art vocabulary. One of them is the word resplendence, and the other word's bitchin'. <laughs> and I'm just trying to make them think as bitchin' as I can. You know. Would they entertain me? You know. Jim, did you have a question? Yeah. What what, uh, what what about the move to sculpture that uh, you know, we've seen in some of those images? Well, I appreciate that question. I was a trained sculptor when I was in college, and I did sculpture, and uh, it, retired, it requires labor and space. You know, it, uh, you cannot uh, have a, a beautiful blue sky in a sculpture. You have to sacrifice that for the possibility that you could walk around something and see it in virtually in uh, 360 degrees. So you trade one for the other. and. Uh, in the last six or seven years, I've been financially put in a position where I can do sculptures, you know, and it's been fairly successful. And uh, if the money comes in, I'll keep doing them. If it don't, um, back to them watercolors. But you know, <laughs> but you kind of like never, you know. See, the thing is, is he works with these some of the top kind of fabricators out there, I mean, people who, you know, make make other doodads for other people that sell for like a lot more money, yeah. you know, the kind of coons kind of art out there. And the thing is, art's turned, a, you know, and I know you like to get pissed at the art world, right? So just trying to stoke your fire a bit here. <laughs> but, part but a lot of it is like, you know, they get people to fabricate their work. No, I do the work And myself. you, you do all helpers. the work for I, yourself. I have I mean, helpers. I have you know, helpers. Why could, you know, what's what's the pathology here that you couldn't let go? Because the fact is, is yeah. you know, these great fabricators are so good at it, but well, he wants to sand his own surfboard or whatever it is. I don't have a tag, to, a tail to wag, you know. I gotta keep noodling it something all the time, you know. But when you're working on a 10-foot sculpture, it's a lot of surface, so I gotta have people help me polish that thing out and perf it up and make it nice and paint it and stuff. So it's a hands-on thing with me though, you know, and the fabricators really respect me for that. I don't mean to brag, but uh, yeah. yeah, I will. I just thought it was good. <laughs> <laughs> 
Is that good? Does anyone want to get any last questions in? Or you've got to do sign well, uh, He's going to be signing. Uh, oh. have we got, how much longer do we have here? Because I'm full of stories. So, yo, come on, tell another story. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes? Hey, say a word about Gary Arlington, if you don't mind. Well, you know, Gary passed away. You know? I, I realize that. Well, Gary was a. Gary was uh, one of the very first underground comic dealers in New York, and he was a portly guy. And you know, you want to think, what would a comic book collector be like? It's like this hermit sits in his room reading comic books. This uh, Gary Arlington was like that. And Gary Arlington, back in the 50s, every time an EC comic come out, there's like about 20 different variations each month, he would buy five of each one of them. So years later, he's sitting on this remarkable collection of mint sets, full mint runs of ECs. And I think uh, Rick Griffin beat him out of a set, traded him artwork for a set. And of course, when it fell into Rick's hands, he, he had to go sell it off for drugs or something, you know. It didn't last long in Rick's hands. But uh, uh, Gary, uh, Gary was the, the prototypical comic book nerd. You know, and he had a fellow working for him named Rory Hayes. It was like this wall-eyed, mentally ill person that did comics. <laughs> and his stuff, Rory Hayes' stuff has got enormously f valuable and famous. So my wife Suzanne was the first one to collect it. Now big collectors are putting large sums of money hunting up those Rory Hayes crazy comics, you know, so. That's the, Gary Arlington was just a slice of underground life, you know. It was a, a lot of mentally disturbed people played in that uh, ball game, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I remember uh, 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 Rory Hayes was going to go on a big long trip. He had some money, he saved up some money. And the first motel he went to, it had a, one of those electric massagers in the bed, and he put all his trip money to go on a future trip, all coins for the work, work up and down on the massaging bed. So, so, and then on top of that, Gary Arlington got uh, Rory Hayes' mother pregnant, and so... Uh, and, and, and the aesthetics here, you don't want to know. <laughs> so I don't know how much gossip I should... You know, dirty laundry here to spread about the underground world, but it was pretty sleazy, you know. <laughs> well, I, I brought a whole bunch of my old underground collection to sell at this. These things haven't seen the light of day except for me for 40 years. The first one I sell today, San Francisco Comics number one, the Rory Hayes on the cover, and it sold like that, so I know it was underpriced. Well, I, I don't know, you know. <laughs> well, Mentally ill. It's like illustrated with <coughs> illness. It's yeah. It is. It is. You know, and uh, that was the world I functioned in. You know. So, uh, I've been there too. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the LA celebrities that you broke shoulders with? Well, that's. Uh, I don't know. You know. Okay. Uh, the the guy that did the. the how much time do I have here? Okay. Okay. The the uh, the head distributor of underground comics in Los Angeles for years and years was a fellow named George DiCaprio. <laughs> and he had a, he had a kid. He was named Leonardo. <laughs> and George was like anyone else in the underground comic world. You know, he's a problematic. <laughs> so we come up with a comic book called Felch. Now let me, I'm going to explain Felch to you without using any dirty words. <laughs> S. Clay Wilson said that they, he was talking to Ken Weaver of the Fugs and Ken Weaver says there was this word Felch. It was a real old word, a real old dirty word. It went way, way back in the time. I asked Wilson, what, 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 what did it mean? And Wilson told me, I said, man, that's the next comic, it's Felch. It's orally withdrawing the semen out of someone's lower tract after they've been sodomized. That's felching. Wow. <laughs> I didn't use any dirty words. 
So, you know, that was the dirtiest comic. Crum and all of us did some work in Felch, you know. So anyway, uh, George DiCaprio had all these bookstores and head shops that he serviced with underground comics, and one of them got busted. The police went in there and grabbed up all the underground comics. They took them, they took them to the police station. So this, is, uh, this was going to go to court. This was going to be a test case. So the, the, the police figure, well, the most filthiest thing in here, the prosecutor figures, the way we're going to win this case is on this Felch comics. So this big box of underground comics is in the police station for a while, and I guess some cops were going through the laughing, going through the comics, and they saw that little Felch, and they figured, well, nobody's going to miss this, and they took that Felch, see? So anyway, this thing, this thing goes to the courthouse, and there's a hearing for it, and George is sitting outside the judge's office, and uh, he's, he's there with the, the clerk that got arrested, and the owner of the bookstore, and a lawyer. And the door was open, and all they could hear was the prosecuting attorney digging through the box looking for the felch. And the judge is yelling, well, where's the felch? Where's the felch? <laughs> so, so they couldn't find the felch, and they dropped the case. <laughs> oh. I think I better end this thing here. <laughs> Are there any more questions or anything? Are you? I guess that's it.